without further ado, I'm, I'm obviously very conscious of the time and we, we have got to come back over to the main stage at 12.50 prompt. So um, thanks everybody for joining us. Peter, really delighted that we could that we Lee, thank you for stepping in and, you, and Richard. And I'm so no sorry, problem. everybody. Um, it, it, was, it was computer meltdown at my end. Um, it, it happens. Um, it's post-COVID era, which um, I'm going to touch on actually in a, in a little moment, Peter, and probably come to you. So we've heard from BDO um, in respect to reinventing manufacturing and, and reinventing the industry. Um, Peter, we were due to hear um, about the emerging requirements from yourself, which hopefully we, we can touch on in a moment. Um, obviously, the draft safety bill places high demand on, on technology um, to, to achieve these things. Um, all around that sort of competency around sharing data and the impact of sharing data. But then by surprise this year, we obviously had the COVID pandemic that, that has obviously sent a shockwave through the industry and, and um, had had impacts and probably is going to keep having impacts that some of us maybe haven't even anticipated yet. So I think if I can divert a question to you, Peter, first, it's probably going to be, um, are you seeing acceleration in digital change amongst your manufacturers? Um, or has the COVID pandemic impacted this negatively or is it something that's accelerated it? Um, and, and what are your thoughts on that process really? Lee, I think, you know, we, we, we have seen over quite a few years, um, shall we say, patchy response. Um, and I think the, the pandemic has definitely um, slowed things up. And fundamentally for quite a few months, we've been in survival mode. Uh, yeah. And then we've got the, the, the realisation as everybody is, is coming out of, of that initial impact in the spring, we've got Brexit just around the corner. Uh, and and the, trouble, the trouble is, I think, that there are quite a few issues that are related to Brexit and the new structure of, of how we will we'll be covering standards and, and uh, the new construction products regulations. And they directly relate to to the impact of the building safety bill and the new regulator and the new way we'll be looking at products going forward because of that. So I think we've we've got a bit of a trippy wham, triple whammy situation, I'm afraid. Uh, and I, I think from for most of our members, it's a really difficult time. So trying to get clarity as to how we take these things forward is the challenge. But I think digital is definitely going to be an answer navigating through this really difficult period for people excellent thanks very much i think some of those key points that, that you mentioned there were was sort of depicted very clearly graphically in robin's presentation just on on how the marketing side can go in and, and really ties in nicely to what adam was saying just before and as well um i'm going to flip a question over to, to bdo and, and mithin or john I, I don't mind which one of you you wants to answer this but obviously we've just heard from peter and we've been talking about digital a lot um in respect to, to BDO's view, what have you noticed for manufacturers that has been one of the biggest impacts to them other than digital? And, and where are those changes going to come from, from your perspective? Uh, other than digital, I'd sort of probably come to back to sustainability that, that yeah. we talked about. So, um, you know, more, more sort of sustainable products uh, in, in, into the marketplace. Um, you know, partly as a response to regulation, you know, net, net zero buildings, that carbon footprint, um, but also investors, you know, the, the investors have definitely got uh, environmental, social, uh, corporate governance on their agenda, um, you know, and, and they're sort of wanting to invest in responsible businesses. But, um, so I think, I think that's probably, you know, other than digital, I'd, I'd probably highlight that one. Um, I don't, may have some yeah, I think thoughts. in terms of, um, I think we we touched, I think John touched upon it in, in the session. So the complexity of the supply chain, as well, um, given uh, given the pandemic uh, and also Brexit around the corner, people have already been thinking about this um, and and how to um, uh, extract the best value out of the supply chain in a more efficient and uh, uh, speedy manner, um, and also leading on to uh, sort of customer services as well, based around. That, that that complex supply chain and how we can make it better essentially sure, so. Just on the digital point there lee we, we have seen uh, and to peter's point that there are businesses out there that we've we've spoken to who who have gone on that data curve and linked that data into an, an, an analysis and, and better decision making um and from our perspective that sort of data will help explain the prospects of a business um, when, when you're coming, when you're talking about mergers and acquisitions, mm -hmm. um, 
So we're seeing a huge demand for data analytical guys um, in the marketplace uh, and, and the larger organizations are certainly um, investing quite heavily in that area. And COVID has accelerated in some, some areas. Great. I think just, just, just to add to that, I mean, on, on the, that data front, I was talking to a, um, a client yesterday who, uh, I mean, they put use data to put more KPIs into the business um, you know, because it's been able to allow them to measure things more clearly. Uh, not not just the, the numbers, not just the PL, but also the underlying kind of key performance indicators. And they've shared that with their staff. So they've been quite open and transparent and, and kind of shared that. Uh, and they've found some huge benefits from that because you know everyone kind of knows where where the business stands excellent so it's that clarity of information again isn't it it's really sort of refreshing to hear about it from a from an acquisition and mergers sort of theme instead of the the, the sort of sale and procurement process for the products themselves um adam i'd like to sort of go over to yourself obviously you, you chair of the marketing integrity group but you've also um run a lot of manufacturing businesses so um, with either hat on the manufacturer one or, or your, your marketing integrity group hat on um, what would be your advice to manufacturers now based on on this information and, and the sort of discussions we've just been having to to best place themselves are you talking about with regards to the code or are you talking about the digitization with the code or digitization i think it all sort of interlinks doesn't it really do you know I, I, and it's interesting, Chris Witt has uh, put up a question about the ASA and, and just to bring that in, we did consult with the ASA, we've met with them um, and the ASA are challenging what's, what's law and the code is, not, is, is about things that are ambiguous. So manufacturers will typically play a game of top trumps and who can blame them? They'll put forward the things that are strong about their product and they won't put through the things that are weaker about their products against the competition. And these are the games that are played and, you know, starting to recognise that those those conversations are impacting the safety of the buildings that are being built. So my message to manufacturers is we've got to get our in order and we've got to start behaving with true integrity. We've got to understand that it is really important that we put forward the information on our products professionally, correctly. We don't use ambiguous statements. We make sure the information is accurate and we do everything we can to ensure that it's accurate. We make sure we maintain it as being up to date and we keep it clear so that people can understand it um, and that we just take the the responsibility that well, we have a phenomenal industry. You know, we produce a, a good percentage of GDP, around 8% of GDP. We employ hundreds of thousands of people. We're well thought of across the world. We've been involved in export around the world. Um, got a Queen's Award for International Trade, you know. Um, British companies are perceived as being companies that have good products, do things properly. We've got to do it right here. We've got to lead the way. We have got to take on board. It's time to stand up, be prepared to be counted, and put the energy and effort into doing things right and make sure that we maintain that integrity. And the code is a guideline for which companies can, can understand the things that are important to follow to do that. Brilliant. I think two, two sort of key things there is that clarity, number one, and then keeping things up to date. Um, the amount of times as a manufacturer I would have received specifications and with, with sort of faxed and copied and photocopied from 15 years ago products that were now obsolete um, is, is a nightmare. And it still happens now, even, even in sort of a digital era. Um, I think on that, it might be a good time to sort of ask Robin the question now. And, and Robert, Robin, to combat that, what would be your sort of top two or three sort of um, bits of advice for manufacturers to make sure that they are, are geared up and ready for, for this new scrutiny that, that's coming? it starts with, uh, with having good data about their own products um you know i've, I've met manufacturers before who, who struggle to you know articulate how many SKUs they've got in their systems or, or or whatever it might be because they're the information is spread over different places so i think given that that is kind of mission mission critical to their business way above and beyond just just whatever they're pushing out on marketing it's absolutely essential that that data is is well organized and that there are processes around that to to manage it properly and, and and stay on top of it so so that would be the first thing um and i think the other things would be would be making sure that that data is then um surfaced and, and used internally and, and externally in, in the right ways and uh you know i'd always say that this is this is perfectly doable so you know if you look at retail e-commerce and you look at um you know the the, the, the giants whether it's from mns to um ao.com 
you know, they have tens of thousands of products in their warehouses. You can find and compare, you know, 10 different washing machines side by side, see which one is the loudest, the most energy efficient, the most expensive, has the longest warranty, whatever it might be. You can then select it, see whether it's in stock, get it delivered the next day, see all the options, whatever it might be. All of that is data and process coming together to enable that. And it, it, it just proves that the systems and the technologies are there to do that. It needs that um, that will and that desire and that that um, that cultural change in order to make that happen. Thanks very much, Robin. Um, I think yeah, it's 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 obviously something that that's moving now, um, and everybody here is, is sort of witnessing things. Um, the digitalization process itself has has been compared or sort of asked whether this is going to end up going down a sort of a more of an e-commerce route with, with construction products and, and somebody threw a great question up earlier in the chat as to um, do we think that could be an hindrance to the industry um, in respect to the fact that with specifications um, sort of generally leading building design um, would an e-commerce solution maybe see the result of people procuring products incorrectly um, Peter I think that might be a, a good one for maybe you to sort of respond to have you got any thoughts on that at all well I I, I just, if you don't mind, I just wanted to comment uh, on the back of that um, thread that we've just been talking through, because um, yep. another another um, package of work that, that CPA have been have been doing is in connection with the raising the bar and setting the bar. Yeah, uh, confidence work that uh, that the, the industry response group has been pursuing, uh, and obviously that report many will know came out last week. The, the, the work that, that um, we've been doing under the products heading of that um, intends to set a challenge for the rest of industry to be competent with the interactions they all have with products. So from a client right the way through consultants, contractors to supply chain, what we're trying to do is provide a mechanism to establish the level of competence that you need in all those processes and so therefore it comes directly into that element that we're just talking about making sure you specify things properly so for me the the marketing integrity work and the competence work are the yin and yang of this particular part of the conversation and generally responding to dame judith's challenge to the industry to actually take the lead and become more competent and actually generate a, a, a culture change now coming back to your original question I think, yes, where e-commerce is starting to move into construction, there is definitely uh, a need to embrace that because I don't think it's gonna, gonna be stopped anytime soon. Um, and, and I think basically it's, a, it's another um, element that the, that the construction industry has to get a grip with. Um, and yep. actually it can be used to great effect. So uh, I, I, I see it as just something that is an inevitable uh, maturing of our part of, of business uh, and I think everybody needs to be joining up everything we possibly can to make sure the response is is um, appropriate definitely brilliant so tying that all into this the specification procurement process yeah. that it, it's obviously yeah something that needs to be aligned yeah um, and, and probably information as well Lee, because yep. you know uh, you know websites have got a lot of product information on them um, mm -hmm. you know, so so you can uh, give give customers um, lots of sort of confidence in that product uh, you know we sort of drawn parallels with the retail industry if you draw one with financial services you know that another heavily regulated industry that, that has got lots of customer information around those products and, and it's been sort of you know required to do that and increase its its game in that respect over the years great yeah just so the one of the e-commerce lead just 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 to go back to that a little bit uh, we we have seen different business models um uh, of e-commerce and I think the, the the more successful ones are offering that consultative sell um, so although you can build a basket uh, or, or on, a, on an online platform of products somebody's checking over that basket for example and, 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 and advising accordingly with a call center operation to be able to talk to somebody uh, with that with the, with the product knowledge to advise whether which products are suitable for in, in which situations and that product that we were finding that business model quite successful at the moment. Thanks, Smith. And so, yeah, it, it all ties into that sort of clarity of data again. I think that's yeah. probably going to be my parting message. I'm, 
I did have a few more questions, but unfortunately we, we've completely run out of time. I think this may be something that we could perhaps pick a webinar up on later. Mm -hmm. um, leave that with you, Robin. Um, but yeah, thanks everybody for attending um, and everybody that's been, been listening. Um, thank you so much. We're going to wrap the day up now. So if everybody that's listening could move over to the main stage and our um, Chief Strategy Officer, Richard, is going to wrap up the day and, and pull it to a close. Thank you very much, everybody, and stay safe. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you. Take care. Bye. Thanks.